analyze the policies being implemented today that will shape our future tomorrow. Hosted by Bri Anna Sagdal, the editor of Dakota Leader, a policy news publication focused on a transpartisan approach to illustrating the tones of gray in an increasingly black and white world. Found at www.dakotaleader.com, the Dakota Leader is home to political orphans and those brave enough to question partisan rhetoric in an attempt to find common ground regarding the world of South Dakota's policies and political dynamics impacting your kitchen table. Today we review the headlines and highlights from the week. This show is made possible Hmm. I don't know what's unmute. Right. Well, that's really interesting. It looks like um, we were cut off there. I apologize. I'm Brianna Sagdahl. I'm your host uh, here at Dakota Leader. Today we have a really uh, jam-packed show and I'm really excited. So um, I want to get started on that. Uh, joining us here today is our um, associate editor, Miss Anna Cole, and I'm really excited. I missed her. She's been on the road, and she uh, joins us here today to tell us about her adventures outside of South Dakota and what she's noticed. Um, Anna, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. It's good to be back in town here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, your camera's like right, right. Can you like bring, there we go. Oh, there there we go, there we go. All right, that's a lot better. <laughs> Wonderful. Gosh, I really hope we're on air right now. You know, I'm seeing this um, quirky little thing that says that the studio has paused and I hope I haven't done anything to, to mess that up. Right. Um, <laughs> so, good times. Um, yep. You know, I, um, no, it looks like it's, I don't know. So we'll figure it out, right? The technology is always evolving faster than people can keep up at this point. Well, and that's kind of what we're about to talk about, isn't it? Totally, um, right. <laughs> so I have, uh, and I'm recording on my end, so I think we'll be good. Um, good. <clears throat> okay, so you took off across country and, um, and you, where you went to Renegade Man, which is like an offshoot or um, kind of like a parallel to Burning Man, uh, created right. by the same, kind of the same people that started Burning Man until Burning Man sold out, right? Right. Oh, it's so interesting how it started because Renegade Man has only existed since summer 2020. And the story behind it is that everything was shut down because of COVID, obviously, uh, in the summer of 2020. And there was a group that decided to go off into the Black Rock Desert without the approval of the Bureau of Land Management, the Burning Man organization, any of the normal bureaucracy that supports the event. Meanwhile, there, were, there was also a lot of people that did virtual Burning Man that year. So they would put on their VR headset and have this whole, um, you know, 3D metaverse type experience, almost like leaning more into the matrix. Well, this other group that did Renegade Man went back to the basics of, well, what if we just bring a few gallons of water in a tent and go off into the desert and see what happens? And then Renegade Man got really big last year in 2021. They had about 20,000 people show up. Uh, I heard even Paris Hilton showed up last year and did a DJ set there. Oh. So then this year, Burning Man came back and the official event was back on. But several people said, you know, I think Renegade Man was actually better. It was back to the basics. It was back to the real principles of Burning Man. Let's keep that going. And for people who don't know what Burning Man or Renegade Man um, might be, can you give us just a brief synopsis of what this, you know, artist, art, artistic festival in the desert is? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the nickname for it is actually that thing in the desert. So the idea behind Burning Man is that people create a temporary city. This is in the Black Rock Desert of Nevada. So it's one of the most barren landscapes in the entire country, probably. But you see the mountains on every side 
and the surface that you're camping on is playa dust. So if it gets wet, it turns into clay. It's not even like a normal sand type structure that you'd see in a desert normally. And the big thing that they focus on with Burning Man is that they build a temple where people leave offerings. It's about letting go. It's about processing your feelings. Um, coming back to normal life with a different view on everything, different perspectives. And of course, they burn the effigy of the man. So they have this giant wooden structure of a man that they build out in the desert, and they have it burned down in the most spectacular way possible. <laughs> the renegade man, they don't actually burn anything. They do a drone show instead because they're not allowed to burn anything that big without the organization approving it first. Because one of the rules of Burning Man is that you leave no trace. So they have to be able to clean up all the ashes afterwards too. Right. And then there's principles that go into being at Burning Man, such as the fact that it is a decommodified society. You're not allowed to buy or sell anything there with a couple of exceptions. I think at the original one, they sell ice, they might sell coffee. Other than that, you carry in and carry out everything. So you leave no trace. Uh, bring everything you need to survive in that environment and it'll be you know up to 110 degrees during the day it could be 40 or 50 degrees at night there's sandstorms it's the most harsh environment you can imagine but people bring all sorts of art they uh, modify their cars and they bring their art cars they set up entire installations that take weeks to get prepared um, they have sound systems they have different sound camps they have different um, interactive art installations and experiences that people can take part in. Right, and, and there have been a lot of ideas that have come out of Burning Man and Renegade Man that have completely shaped our political sphere, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it really leans into the whole anarchist or libertarian idea. Um, and the radical self-reliance especially seems like a libertarian kind of idea to me. Uh, the idea that you bring what you need, you are responsible for yourself, you go to, especially to renegade man, you go at your own risk. They figure if you're doing this, you're doing it because you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, I think um, the original Burning Man community, I was part of that in New York City. Uh, I was I was going to a lot of costume cult events because I was working in the fashion industry, and those were people that had a lot of money to be commissioning costumes. And I noticed that during the vaccine rollout last year, I was getting emails that Costume Cult was bringing back their events in New York City, but they were all vaccine proof only. So, and some of them required masks in addition to vaccine proof. And I was thinking, this kind of goes against the ethos of you are responsible for yourself. You go into the desert at your own risk. You bring what you need and you know what risks you're taking and you're consenting to the risks of being alive by doing these events. So you had kind of the wealthy, upper, um, bougie uh, academia class, if you will. Um, oh, absolutely. Kind of get involved and take over part of this very like grassroots, um, rugged, art artistic. Function, right. right. Like, and that, that kind of seems to be a general theme from what I've seen, like, um, do you, I, I mean, like what well, Occupy Wall Street was another really good example of that, right? Oh, that was a great example. Yeah, well, it actually, that one kind of branched off too. I mean, there were people still practically living out of Zuccotti Park into 2013 even. Um, a lot of the people that were sort of on the ground at Occupy were actually the same ones that were hopping freight trains. They were going to punk shows. They were living in squats. They, and a lot of them would come in and out of New York City seasonally. So they'd come back to New York during the summer when the weather was mild enough. And then they'd be back, say, in California or Florida or whatever for the winter. Eventually, they stopped migrating back in for the summer because New York got to be too inhospitable towards um, travel kids and punks and that sort of like the the sort of like punk style of New York was fading away throughout the 2010s so they stopped sure. showing up quite as much yeah and I think you know similar things happened in the Chaz in Seattle right the um, right. autonomous zone and it really started out as the symbol of social justice and very quickly denigrated into um, a very violent uh, you know, society, and I mean, just within a matter of weeks, and and people potentially can make the argument for uh, controlled opposition or agent provocateurs. I don't, I don't know, but um, but it is interesting how certain 
you know, factions will come in and more or less hijack these uh, movements or um, things that are created with one intent and steer it into another. And, right. um, and in that we see some pretty uh, horrific human suffering and that could just potentially be the fallacy of man, right? And so I've, I've often um, theorized what it is that takes these utopian ideas and quickly uh, just, they, they very, you know, quickly disintegrate. And, um, and so I wanted to ask your opinion on that and especially what life outside of South Dakota looks like as you're, you know, as you're traveling to uh, Renegade Man this year, did you notice the human suffering because of the ideas that have become recent um, and recently woven into uh, US policy, for example? Absolutely. I mean, I the last time I did a cross country trip like this was actually in 2010 and I took a bus trip from Chicago to um, Portland, Oregon that year. And that year I felt like everyone was able to trust each other really easily. Everyone got along. People were from all different backgrounds, all different parts of the country on this bus trip. And there didn't seem to be any tension whatsoever. This year when I traveled across the country, I felt like things, they're not a disaster, but we're on the precipice of something happening. I noticed there were a lot more tent cities throughout the country. I noticed a lot more um, income inequality, a lot more homeless people, a lot more desperation, especially mm -hmm. in the cities. Mm -hmm. And I noticed even among my friends, there's a lot more stress about finances and how, where their next job is going to come from. And there's so much more division, even within my group that I was supposed to camp with, the group fell apart over some of these political issues, even though they seem like they should all be on the same side together. Wow. They could not get along enough for all five people. Only two out of the five of us actually made it to the desert because there was so much infighting. Wow. I don't think that that, like five years ago, I cannot see that happening. Like there might be personal issues that can happen in those groups. And to be fair, th that type of trip does put a lot of pressure on a friendship or relationship, anything like that, because it's just the, the stress of getting out there. It's a very ambitious project to do that kind of travel and to do that kind of camping. But the fact that it was over a lot of political issues in addition mm -hmm. to economic issues was completely different than it would have been a few years ago. Do you think that the issues have become more intense or do you, in your experience, think that people have become less capable of handling uh, or n navigating these difficult and uncomfortable conversations with friends and um and and i'll just ask that question because then we could get into a whole litany of why but <laughs> oh i mean there's so many layers to it right um, so do you think it's the issues or do you think it's um uh our maybe inability to cope or new generations and their inability to cope with i would say a lot of it is just the inability to navigate socially because people were so isolated um i mean with the specific group i'm talking about the friend that did end up making it with me is my friend amaris who i met in new york city originally she lives in denver now and um, we're working on an art installation together. Mm -hmm. um, and she has had a lot more luck with sort of freely being able to uh, move socially within the last year because she did get vaccinated. She prefers not to go to vaccine only events and she's anti-mandate, but she did have the option and she did have the, you know, she was able to show her papers and go to these events. So she felt like she was accepted. The other three people in the group were all unvaccinated and they were people that I originally met through a website that branched off after Reddit banned the group No New Normal. And these were people mostly in blue states. Um, the guy who was kind of like the ringleader of the whole group lives in San Jose, California. And I think I've noticed that his, it's like, I. the best way to put it is I can tell that the isolation and the discrimination has gotten to him. Mm. And like I told him around the time that I was considering leaving New York say, State that maybe he should look into leaving California. He decided not to because his whole family's there. He didn't want to leave his family. Sure. So 
I think the isolation and like he got like he sort of internalized that discrimination to the point where my friend who's vaccinated, even though she's anti-mandate, he saw her as a threat. Oh. And he doesn't understand like there's a nuance to this of like she's not your enemy. She's actually looking out for people like you with this art installation we're doing. But he felt attacked by that. Or people with the No New Normal will talk about how vaccinated people have these spike proteins. And then I thought, how is that any different than the vax people saying that the unvaxed are constantly um, the cause of asymptomatic spread? It's the same sure. thing of like. Right. 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 And it's and it's that othering that really creates yeah. Yeah, division. I understand what you're saying. Um, Anna, thank you so much for for sharing with us today. I really appreciate um, your trip and your willingness to be bold and to go cross country. And um, yep. uh, any last thoughts on sort of life outside of South Dakota? Anything else that kind of pops out in your head? Uh, well, the thing that I've been saying to people, um, especially about the larger cities, is the higher you fly, the harder you fall. So. Mm -hmm. You live in a rural area and you're more self sufficient and you are focused on survival right now. You're going to do a lot better with what's coming than the people outside that are stressing about things and they're trying to live life like it's still the 2010s. They don't know what's about to happen, but they do know that they don't feel right. Wow, fascinating. Anna, thank you so much. I'm really grateful for your time. Yep, no problem. All right, take care. Yep, bye bye. Bye. If you're uh, joining us here, we are coming back live with our uh, <clears throat> our next guest, Representative Steve Haugard. And um, Representative Steve Haugard is sits on the Appropriations Committee here in South Dakota and previously ran for governor. Um, Steve's joining us today to, to discuss um, uh, federal dollars and how they impact um, state policy and uh, touch a little bit on that human suffering side like we were just discussing with uh, Miss Anna and um, hopefully we'll get Steve here shortly. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Oh, good. Well, we're so happy to have you on. And uh, so we were just speaking with associate editor of the Dakota Leader, Anna Cole, and she was sharing a little bit about her road trip to um, an artist event called Renegade, Renegade Man, which is sort of like Burning Man. And she was touching a bit on, you know, the level of human suffering and um, and just what she's noticed in this country outside of South Dakota. Now we have it pretty good here in South Dakota. Um, things are things are bright and sunny, and people might not really know what's happening outside of our borders. So that was a eye-opening conversation with Miss Cole as she explained, you know, a little bit more about the tent cities and um, shanty towns all across the country right now and uh, economic, true economic devastation and how it's wreaking havoc on on people that you would um, ordinarily consider middle class. And um, and so I'm excited to have you on the call today. And uh, I wanted to discuss, you know, you made some really amazing statements during the last legislative session uh, on during your time on the Appropriations Committee. And I, I learned so much from you, so I want to say thank you. And um, and also, I just thought, wow, here is a man who is willing to stand up for his principles. And I just thought it was really impressive that you were willing, you know, to challenge the the governor on federal dollars. And and you had said something that really woke me up. And um, you know, and I and I I can't remember exactly what it was that you said. So let's. I want to have you explain it a little better, a little bit better. But I hope that was woke in a good way. What? Oh but no! I can't. Good way. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, it, it was eye-opening. How about that? That's better. Um, 
Yeah, there certainly are a lot of issues associated with federal money and and our reaction to that. And it goes all the way from highway funds to medical care to now these mandates and everything else. So there are a lot of issues, a lot of attention needs to be given to that. And, and it would be great if we pump the brakes real hard on federal money because we're $31 trillion in debt. Well, you make a very interesting point, and one of your colleagues on the Appropriations Committee recently wrote an op-ed and sent it to the Dakota leader in which she argues against Medicaid expansion, not for the typical reasons that you would hear, but she says, you know, the federal government is not handling our money well. It's already bankrupt. It's, uh, you know, social Social Security, for example, is going to run out by 2034. And, and she's asking the question, how do we expect the federal government to handle this any differently when they haven't proven to us that they can handle our money uh, in the past? So I, I think that's that might touch a little bit on what you're, you're saying, right? Well, when you look at any of the federal intervention with federal uh, dollars, whether they're real or created, you just see that the reaction of the states is to accommodate that uh, push of dollars, thinking that that somehow is going to solve all sorts of problems. And, and all it does is it just creates new unintended consequences. So the if you just, I've said this many times before, if you just apply your principles and live by your principles, then everything else will shake out as, as you go along. But if you try to uh, create this brave new world with a new socialist agenda, it will not work. Mm. It simply put us into such a compromised position that we can't survive. Fascinating. And and speaking of a brave new world, um, I'll put you on the spot just a little bit. Have you had the opportunity to uh, check out President Biden's new executive order that was signed on Monday about the um, bioeconomy yeah, I I scanned through that. Um, I, I forget how many orders he's signed now. It's 90 or something like that. And and that's kind of typical on track for what uh, presidents have done over the past years. But the, uh, the whole idea that somehow the federal government is uh, far more intellectually attuned to these issues, it's just uh, you can't exclude the the element of politics and posturing and agendas from those things. It's just like the vaccine mandates now. And, you know, if there was tried and true, clear, unequivocal science associated with these things, that'd be one thing. But that's not true. It's like so many uh, organizations that push their agendas. Um, when you review their their research and their their peer reviewed research, you find that they're peers are not the full scope of scientific research. It's just a, kind of a, a internal uh, closed circle of people that have an agenda. And sadly, that's what's going on with the federal government. They don't they don't step back and, and limit their involvement. They're trying to be proactive. And that's too many times the cases with governors as well. That's what we see all across the nation is so many governors see themselves as being a CEO of a company. Well, that's not it. It's, you know, the legislature and the, the executive branch should probably be quite a limited time and in, in involvement in people's lives. And people can just function and the, the market will find its own levels and uh, needs and wants will be met as, as, uh, as appropriate. You know, that's really interesting. Anna was uh, just telling us about sort of the theme for these uh, artistic events and gatherings, and she mentioned the term radical self-reliance. And it reminds me a lot of what you're talking about here. You're more or less pushing people to be self-reliant and telling people, we don't, we don't want you dependent on the government, right? because then you create reliance upon us. All right, I'm going to you hang on. We're going to hold you over the break. You are joining us live on Revolution. 
Okay, well, we're back from commercial break there, and uh, I have Representative Steve Haugard on with me today, and we are discussing um, the impact of federal funding on states, um, and we are also, uh, you know, discussing more or less the um, amount of human suffering that is happening in this current economy, and um, and and how policy is impacting individual lives. Um, Steve, uh, or excuse me, Representative Haugard, um would you like to maybe talk us through a little bit about the the federal funding that was implemented this last session and um, perhaps some of the, the programs that it will be creating this year and, and maybe any issues that you may or may not see with that? Well, those federal funds that started with the CARES Act and then ARPA and I, there might have been one or two others, they, they came out with a very broad description of what their in, intended purpose was and along with that there was a tremendous lack of specific guidance on how to implement this the time frames and everything associated with it so some of the money um, needs to be allocated uh, i think by 2024 and potentially spent by 2026 so we're talking about some of this being stretched out a long way and this past session, there was, uh, I think, an unnecessary rush to try to find ways to put all this into certain pigeonholes. And it, um, it, it shapes what the state does, the focus the state has, and uh, probably it shapes a lot in the way of uh, construction industry and that sort of thing as well. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you'll end up with uh, pulling workforce out of certain areas where maybe they should be left. So like I say, the, the, the influx of federal money has all sorts of unintended consequences. And even um, at the beginning of our last session or this past session in January in 2022, there was a push to disperse money specifically for child care. Well, that's not the role of the state and it filtered down through the federal government and had we demonstrated any degree of leadership we would have responded accordingly the state does not receive this money in a vacuum it's, it shouldn't be as though uh, the federal government knows better so therefore we just take it if it's if it's uh, available that's wrong that doesn't show leadership that simply shows uh, dependency and a, a willingness to comply with federal dictates and mandates and that changes the scope of child care it changes the scope of whether some people will go to work or not right it changes the uh, the number of employees maybe that exist in a given uh, area of uh, service right, so because there, there are um, stipulations right on on accepting these funds and I know you know for us at the Dakota leader I think we were one of the only news publications that did a deep dive and investigative reporting into what those stipulations were for receiving daycare dollars, for example. Like, for example, the state only gave that money to licensed daycare providers as opposed to private daycare providers. And then we went through the actual application that was put together by the third party Governor Nome had hired to go through these uh, the application process. And we found right there in the agreement that daycare providers must agree to following to the greatest extent possible the CDC guidelines and so we went into the CDC guidelines and we looked up exactly what it says for early development and outlined right in those orders are masking for anyone ages two years and up and mandatory vaccination and I thought how how interesting you know it how interesting that daycare dollars would be implemented in a state that has taken such a fierce stand against mandates or um a seemingly large stand anyways well you know there we have a history of uh, being willing to receive federal money and that uh, i suspect it goes back to the probably the 1950s 1960s where it was uh, incremental increase in dollars that had an impact on our state 
But then you get into the late 60s and into the 70s and 80s, and all of a sudden there is a big hand stuck out there waiting for federal money that was in the form of Medicaid dollars and that sort of thing. So that continued to grow. And at this point, our state budget, uh, it's close to $6 billion now, but only about 40% of that is money that we generate. The other 60% is federal money. And in this day and age, it's not federal money, it's federal debt. Mm. So when we when we receive those dollars, we contribute to the overall uh, debt of the nation and that does not show leadership and it doesn't mean that you cut off completely from every program because there are some things that are the function of both the nation and the state and those things you need to be discerning about but uh, we've gone way past the scope of uh, what the government's responsibility is and we've gotten into an area where we're creating dependency that should not exist well and, and that's why you see these the, all the homeless for example I mean, so many of those people, they've been lured into a program along the way, and then the program might go away. Or the economy changes because there's been a federal program that came along and their jobs evaporated because there was a push in a different direction. So those unintended consequences are devastating. And as a state, we could lead the nation in all those areas. We could demonstrate that we do not have to take federal money for education because still it's only in the range of about 20%. But that drives a lot of what we do in our, our academics at the K-12 level, especially. And if we had stepped back and recognized, okay, if we limit that involvement of the federal money, we can probably better shape our own curriculums and allow the local school boards to have more of an input and uh, have the teachers more engaged in teaching than keeping track of rules and regulations. Well, and speaking of which, right, the, the <clears throat> Uh, state of South Dakota is due for or the seven years has come off, right? And it's due for a new social studies uh, standards. And that's an, another hubbub happening in, in state politics right now. And um, as I understand, you know, there was a task force that was put together and they sort of delivered what people had asked for. And this is all on the Dakota Leader. We actually just published an article this morning uh, going through all the different sides of the debate on the new social studies standards. And, um, you know, I thought it was very interesting that the, the Cheeseman Center for Democracy had put out a poll and it was something like 88% of South Dakotans wanted to see expanded Native American history. And I know I'm kind of going off tangentially here, but I just thought this is so interesting. Um, so the, the new task force had expanded Native American history and culture and uh, living representations of uh, indigenous individuals today and has you know delivered maybe one of the most expansive social studies uh, standards in the nation and now they're getting significant pushback from uh, various you know groups like the SDEA the teachers union um, and, and various educators. And I just I just thought that was really interesting because that's coming up Monday, there's going to be a public comment period. So if anyone is curious about that, check out our article at www.dakotaleader.com. Um, Representative, do you have uh, maybe anything, any, any last um, observations or things you'd like to share with us? Well, anybody that's heard me speak before about uh, education specifically, I always quote Article 8, Section 1 of the South Dakota Constitution. And the, the, the focus of education in South Dakota was um, to be relatively broad, but the, the real goal was to ensure that we have a stable republic. It's not a democracy. Democracy exists when you go to the polls to vote for your elected representative. And then we become a constitutional representative republic. And what it says in Article 8, Section 1 is the stability of a Republican form of government, depending upon the morality and intelligence of the people, it shall be the duty of the legislature to establish a standard and uniform system of education open to the public. And so public education was intended not to be a controversy about various social issues or anything like that. It was to ensure that the, the people of the state would be educated well enough to understand and discern what the 
true topic topics are of the day and and be wise enough to evaluate the news of the day and and then vote for the people who will actually stand up and support the constitution and maintain a stable republic so that should be the overarching goal of everything we do with uh, education standards and when you look at the national ones those some of those are so uh, extreme that they're just uh, social engineering to uh, a high degree and in south dakota we should be much more restrained about that when we talk about uh, critical race theory for example that's solely dependent on the teacher in the classroom and you want to limit the kind of curriculum you have too but it's really dependent on is that teacher looking out for the best interests of the kids and teaching uh, truth and and true history or are they trying to push an agenda so right. those are local control issues absolutely representative thank you so much thank you for joining us today i can't wait thank to you. have you back on um and we'll talk soon thank you all right take care all right you too